So the last time we met, a couple of weeks ago, uh, in Terry's presentation, he raised some different issues that I want to kind of address uh, some thoughts about. And so one of the, the first things that he said was that I had said that there were going to be three weddings. And he was talking about, we all agree that this does have to do with the wedding. The bridegroom is Jesus, the church is the, the bride, and so we all agree on that, but what we kind of disagree is on some of the, the other aspects of that. And so he was laying out his viewpoint of, you know, when he thought the rapture was going to be, which was at the midpoint of the seven years, but he made the statement that I said there were going to be three weddings. I did not say there were going to be three weddings. What I said was, there's one wedding, but there's three different times that there are going to be uh, opportunities. opportunities when the bride is ready. Because it has to be a pure and spotless bride. The scriptures say that he's coming for a pure and spotless bride, so... If there are those that are not pure and spotless, they're not going when, you know, when he calls them. So, in a previous presentation, I laid out uh, the scriptures and the evidence that I see for three, three gatherings. One, what we typically would call pre-trib, one that we would call mid-trib, and we use the term post-trib, but it really isn't post-trib because post means after, and so it's not after the tribulation, it's just right near the end. And I laid out that evidence for that position. And so I just wanted to clarify that uh, it's not three different weddings, it's just that the bride has to be purified to meet the Lord. And so just in kind of uh, reiterating how that was, we had talked about uh, the pre-trib ones are the remnant, the, the pure bride that is walking with him in purity now, as was described in uh, the Church of Philadelphia in chapter 3 of Revelation. And so that was one of the evidences, and we had these scriptures over here on this left-hand side that were about walking in purity and being uh, the way God wants us to be. The, the middle group, which was uh, Carrie's viewpoint too, it describes in Revelation chapter 7, and it, and it says there was this great crowd that appeared in heaven. And the angel asked John, who is it? And he says, I don't know, you're going to have to tell me. And... The angel says, these are those who came out of great tribulation and, and they've made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So, as we had explained earlier, the whole seven years is tribulation. But the last half is the wrath of God. And so, when these show up here at this point, they're coming from this part here. These are the ones that got left behind who were not ready, but they have purified themselves because they found out that not everybody goes at the first call if you're not ready. And so you have to make a decision. You're either really going to get in or you're not. And so that was the middle group. And then the last group, what we call post-trib, the evidence that I showed you is uh, it's Revelation 14, uh, verses 14 to 16, and it says uh, that the angel reaps and harvests the earth, that it's ready. Well, as we've laid out previously, I believe that Revelation is chronological. It goes in order for the most part. And so... This definitely is described as being here in the last three and a half years. And so, 
it, it says the earth was reaped. And then in, in chapter 15, just following right after that, verse 2, here's what it says. And he saw this large group of people in heaven. They got victory over the beast, over the image, over his mark. And so we know that has to be here in the last half because the mark of the beast described in Revelation 13 is implemented here in the middle when the Antichrist, you know, sits on the throne, declares himself to be God, and wants to be worshipped. So the mark of the beast is implemented so the the only way you could get victory over the beast, the mark, the image, and everything would be from this point on. And so that was the basic evidence as to why there are three gatherings to this one wedding. So they will all be gathered to the wedding before Christ returns. These just won't be there as long as these were. Because it also says, we, we looked at these scriptures, uh, Zechariah uh, 14, oh, here it is over here, Zechariah 14 and Revelation 19, 14, uh, both say that the Lord Jesus is coming with all the saints with him. So they're, they're all with him when he comes back to earth to rule and reign in what will be the millennial reign. So that was that was the evidence that I had laid out that there's going to be three gatherings to the one wedding. So that was just just wanted to reiterate and clarify that you know, I wasn't speaking of three different weddings, so to speak. Okay, uh, a second thing uh, Kerry brought up uh, in his presentation that his viewpoint was that, you know, the rapture was going to take place here at this midpoint, and I agree there will be some there, and the scripture that he used but he made the statement that after that point, there wouldn't be any more believers. There wouldn't be any more people being saved after that point. And so where, where I disagree with that statement is there, there are several different scriptures. Uh, one of them is in Revelation 13, 5 through 8 where it says that the Antichrist speaks blasphemies and declares himself to be God, which is at this point, the middle point, and it says he will continue for 42 months, so he will continue for 42 months, but it says he makes war against the saints and overcomes them. Well, so that has to be, if he's making war against saints for those 42 months, that's somewhere in this point. So there has to be some saints in this point of one kind or another. Uh, there's another scripture. It's uh, in Daniel. Uh, I think it's Daniel 7, verses 21 and 22 and 25. It also gives that same reference that from the time that the Antichrist exalts himself here at the middle point that there would be three and a half years before it was all finished and in those verses you can look those up later if you like they're on the handout that I gave you uh, it says he will make war against the saints and overcome them so there's at least two references that say he's going to make war against the saints when there's only three and a half years left. So there does have to be some there. However that occurs, there will be some. So I just wanted to uh, 
share that thought with you. Uh, I kind of laid that out before. Okay, the, the third thing was uh, Terry had shared previously. Uh, Man, you're just picking on me. Oh, no, I'm not picking on you. I'm just kind of offering a little, re a little rebuttal to yeah. Yeah, different well, point of view. Yeah, and, but you're assuming that the revelation is chronological. I'm assuming that so revelation that, is chronological. And I, I don't believe it is. It's chronological in, in section. And so, therefore, that makes it sound like that, that these things would be happening. Right. So, uh, in in regards to that chronological thing, one of the one of the things Terry said was like you have the trumpets and you have the vials and so forth. And so his point of view was that uh, in Revelation, some of these things happen, and then you go farther in the book, and some of those things that it describes is going back to something previously, so that it isn't totally chronological. Well, that's where we just disagree. Uh, and I'll just, I just want to point out, so you, uh, in chapters 8 and 9 of Revelation, you have the, the trumpets and those plagues and judgments. And in chapter 16, you have the bowls of wrath. And so it, it says in chapter 16, and we looked at this the last time that I shared, it says, these are the last seven plagues. And so, if these are the last plague, that means there were plagues before that. And so, I just, I just broke this down. In the trumpets, uh, number one, so there, there's seven, seven of each. Seven trumpets and seven bowls. And so, the first trumpet is, a third of the trees and the grass burn up. Number two is a third of the sea turns to blood. Number three, a third of the rivers uh, are turned bitter from this wormwood, whatever that turns out to be. Something that falls out of the sky makes the, the waters bitter. Number four is a third of the sun, moon, and stars are darkened. Five is the locusts that come up out of the pit. And number six are the four angels that are released from, from it says the Euphrates, that are allowed to kill a third of mankind. And then number seven says the proclamation of God's kingdom has come. Well then when you go over to the bowls of wrath in chapter 16, so number one, the first, the first plague are sores that are poured out on, like boils or sores that are poured out on the people. Number two says that all of the sea is turned to blood. In the trumpets, we had a third of the sea is turned to blood. Now we have all of the sea is turned to blood. So those are two different things. That's not the same thing. And number three, all of the rivers are turned to blood. In the trumpets, we had a third of the rivers being polluted and made bitter, but here they're all turned to blood. Number four of the bowls of wrath is where the sun comes down and is so hot that it burns people. And they talk about global warming. We're going to have global warming all right when God does it. And so that's the fourth bowl of wrath. Number five is darkness is going to fall on the word on the earth and it says there was pain so i don't know what all that means that how the darkness caused pain but the scripture says that they nod their their teeth and so forth because of the pain endured during this darkness and then number six of the bowls of wrath the euphrates river is dried up and the kings of the east come, and, and they're all preparing for Armageddon and coming over to the land of Israel. And then number seven of the bowls of wrath is this great earthquake. It says, like has never been before in all of history. It says all the mountains are going to be leveled. All the islands are going to disappear. And, I mean, it's going to be really cataclysmic. And there's great hailstones. 
So we have those two descriptions. Well, they're not the same thing. So I don't call, I don't see the bowls of wrath as going back and being some, some way related to the trumpets as being the same plague. There's, I see it as being two totally different sets of plague, which proves to me that Revelation is chronological, that these things happen in an order, and it says of those bowls of wrath, these are the last seven plagues, and then God's wrath will be complete. And I, I so. actually agree with you on that. I was referring to the, um, not comparing the trumpets and the vials, okay? I was comparing the sum of the trumpets to the, um, um, the seals. Yeah. Okay. So, anyway, uh, that's just information as for the way that I see that. So, then, here's kind of an interesting one. Uh, Terry's mentioned this a couple of times, and so I went and did a little research to see what I could find, and he made mention that he didn't believe there was going to be a new temple of some kind. And so he's, he's right. There is no single scripture that says, you know, there's going to be a new third temple built. In the same way, you know, there's no scripture that uses the word rapture and says there's going to be a rapture. But they are the same in that we put puzzle pieces together. And when you take puzzle pieces and put them together, you start to see the picture, right? And so that's how we know there's a rapture, that there are a lot of different pieces that you put together, and you see that truth, even though there's not a single verse that just says it that way. Well, it's the same way with this temple thing. So there's no verse that, that just says, you know, there's going to be a third temple built. But anyway, I did some looking up, and so I want to share some scriptures with you that, at least to my satisfaction, uh, I'm going to say prove that I think there will be. So whether there is or not, probably isn't going to make the biggest deal in the world. But uh, so if you have your Bibles, we can maybe just look through these here pretty quickly. Uh, so the first two are going to seem kind of vague, and they aren't specifically about the temple, but there's a reason that I have them here. So the first one is Isaiah uh, chapter 24. Let's just turn over there for a moment. chapter 24 of Isaiah, the, the heading of that chapter is the impending judgment on the earth. And so you read through that, and it's basically it's saying the same thing that, that Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 and all these different things say about how God is going to judge the earth. I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty severe stuff. So when we get right to the end of the chapter, though, uh, let's look here at verses uh, 23, uh, verse 23. What, what chapter are you in? Isaiah 24. Okay, I thought it was 4. Okay. Right. Isaiah 24, and, and the last verse of that chapter, verse 23 after it's gone through all of this judgment and everything God's going to do, it says this, Then the moon will be disgraced and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. So this is in reference to the millennial reign when he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem 
and it says on Mount Zion. So the term Mount Zion is used in a number of different ways. It doesn't mean just one specific thing. But one of the things it can mean is talking about the temple or where God is residing. And so it may seem kind of vague. That's, that's okay. But I'm just putting that out there because it's, you know, he is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem and he's going to be somewhere that he's reigning from. So another one is over in Micah. We turn over to Micah chapter 4. In chapter 4 of Micah, the heading of that chapter is the Lord's reign in Zion. And so, it's describing some of the things that are going to happen, you know, during the millennial reign. And so, verse 7, it says, I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forevermore. And so it's another reference to him ruling and reigning in Mount Zion, which can mean, it can mean the whole area of Jerusalem. It can mean, uh, you've probably maybe heard the term, uh, the city of David, when David was king, there was a part of the city that was called the city of David. So Mount Zion can mean different parts of all of that. But now we're going to get a little more specific. And there's several places in Ezekiel. So turn to Ezekiel. And the first place is chapter 37. In Ezekiel 37, this chapter, you, you've heard about this and, and heard messages about it. It's the Valley of Dry Bones. And so Ezekiel sees, is taken to this vision and sees all the dry bones and, you know, can they live again and so forth. And, and they come to life. And so that part has been fulfilled. Israel has been restored as a nation. It came back to life. It's been restored. But part of Ezekiel 37 has not been fulfilled. And so, if we go to verses uh, 24 through 28, the last few verses of Ezekiel 37, I'm going to start at verse 24. And it says, David, my servant, shall be king over them. So, in the Old Testament, a lot of times, when most of the time, when it uses that kind of terminology, David, my servant, David's already dead and gone, all right? And so, when it says David, my servant, it's talking about Jesus, because he's from the, the line of Judah, following in David's footsteps as being, you know, David was held up as being, you know, the, the, the king that was, Israel's greatest king, you know, so forth. So, David my servant means Jesus. So, Jesus shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. So, he's talking about Israel when the, when the remnant of Israel that receives the Messiah comes in, which we talked about uh, in a previous uh, lesson there, that I believe th they are going to recognize their Messiah during the end of this uh, seven-year period because the Antichrist is going to be oppressing them and really bringing severe trials, tribulations, and all upon the Israelites. 
And so the remnant that receives Jesus, they're going to be there in the millennial kingdom. So he's talking to them. And so another thought I just want to point out, many times, you know, through especially the Old Testament, some of the Bible scholars, they tend to spiritualize it all. You know, a, a spiritual lesson out of whatever it says. And, and that is true. There, there are certainly spiritual lessons to learn from, you know, all of the Old Testament stuff. But I want to uh, suggest that a lot of it, I believe, is a lot more literal than what many scholars make it to be. They just take the spiritual lesson out of it and, and don't see it as being a literal fulfillment that it's actually something that's going to happen. And so, it's both. And so, I just want to iterate that, that yes, there's spiritual lessons we could take out of all of this, but he is speaking to the Israelite people. So, verse 25. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell there, they, their children, and their children's children, forever. Okay, forever is, is on and on forever. And so that is the millennial reign and on. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. So that's Jesus. He's the prince, he's the king, he's forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in the midst forevermore. So sanctuary would be like another name for tabernacle or for temple. Verse 27, my tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God. They shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. And so, this seems to me that there's going to have to be something there that the Lord is dwelling in. And you could use any word, temple, sanctuary, uh, tabernacle. I mean, they're kind of all synonymous words, at least from my point of view. So we have that. Now, a little farther in Ezekiel, as we go on, starting in chapter 40 through the end of the book, Ezekiel has this, this vision, I guess you'd call it a vision, of this new temple. And it goes into great detail, describing every little nook and cranny and what it's for and what it does and so on and so forth. And so, if you turn to uh, Ezekiel 43, I'm going to point out a couple of things here. The heading of this chapter is, The Temple, the Lord's Dwelling Place. So, I'm going to read uh, several verses here. Verse 1, Afterward he brought me to the east gate, the gate that faces toward the east. And so, we saw earlier when Jesus comes back to earth, to the Mount of Olives, that's on the east, on the east of Jerusalem, on the east side of the temple. And so this faces east. Then, down to verse 4. And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate which faces toward the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And then I heard him speaking to me from the temple while a man stood beside me. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. No more shall the house of Israel defile my holy name, 
they nor their kings by their harlotry or with the carcasses of their kings on their high places. So it says he's going to dwell there forever. The soles of his feet will be there. That's a literal thing. And so I think this temple, while it may have spiritual ramifications, is a real temple that he's going to rule and reign in from. And so, turn over a couple more pages to chapter 47. And the title of this chapter is Healing Waters and Trees. So, uh, verse 1. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the front of the temple faced east, the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. And now down to verse 6. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. And when I... Okay, let's see. All right, yes. When I returned there along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. Then he said to me, This water, so this water that's flowing out from under the temple, flows toward the eastern region. It goes down into the valley and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. So the waters that are flowing east from under the temple are flowing towards the Dead Sea. We all know the Dead Sea doesn't, there's no life in it, there's no fish, there's no, you know, nothing other than, you know, chemicals and whatever. So it says when this water flows into the Dead Sea, that water is going to be healed. Verse 9, and it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters go there, for they will be healed, and everything will live wherever the river goes. And it goes on to say there will be fishermen fishing. Ryan, they'll be fishing in the Dead Sea. <laughs> there you go. And then it goes on to talk about these trees that are beside the river, that it says uh, there will be fruit every month, uh, and that it will be the leaves for medicine. Well, in Revelation, it says that exact same thing. And so, the waters are going to flow from the temple and create life in the Dead Sea. But we also have another reference that we had mentioned earlier in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 8. It talks about waters flowing out to the east and the west. So, waters were going to flow to the Mediterranean and waters were going to flow over to the Dead Sea. So we have another confirmation that, that these are actual waters flowing out, out of the temple because Jesus is life, and, you know, we, we say the Spirit is, is a reference, you know, to living waters, and so this water that flows out is life, and it's going to flow to these waters and, and bring life. So, I believe these passages are showing us that there will be a temple of some kind, and there's one more reference that uh, I, I want to bring forth here. I mean, we've, we've mentioned this, but not specifically maybe in this context, which is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, and so... We, we talked about this. So this is talking about the Antichrist when he sets up his abomination and wants to be worshipped in the temple. And so verse 4 says, talking about him who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. And so... Taking all of these puzzle pieces together is 
is evidence that I believe show us that there will be some kind of a third temple, tabernacle, whatever you want to call it, that will be there at that time. So, all the scriptures that you showed us prior to this one were appeared that, and I agree with you, that appeared that there was going to be a temple. But they were all referring to in the millennial time. Okay, so we can, we can, it looks like, you know, I would agree with you that there's going to be a temple in the millennial time, but, but maybe, maybe not. And it doesn't say, it doesn't say when, yeah, exactly. when it will be, when it will yeah, be so. built, but I guess, you know, it depends on your perspective of, of, you know, how you see these things. Like we said at the very beginning, there are different perspectives on all of this prophetic stuff. And so, uh, from the perspective that I hold, though, uh, see, uh, Carrie and my views differ in that a little bit about, uh, perhaps all of the timing and you know what it is about you know the antichrist going in the temple or whatever it is so i want to make this statement many of the scholars and even like in the footnotes of my bible because i went back and looked this up just to make sure many of the scholars say when it talks about the abomination of desolation that well that was Antiochus Epiphanes. And he may well have done some of that. But when he did that was like in the first and second century before Jesus even arrived. It was like, uh, I think one place I saw was 163 to 200 and something BC, before Christ. So that may have well happened i don't dispute that at all but the thing that that proves to me beyond a shadow of a doubt that none of this has to do with Antiochus epiphanies because jesus said in matthew 24 when you see that thing spoken of by daniel the prophet sitting in the holy place then you know beware flee flee the city well Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes was already done and gone so Jesus wouldn't have said when you see what Daniel said if it was already a past event it had to be something still future Amen. Amen. and so uh, he is going to exalt himself and call himself God and, and all that. I mean, we've been through those scriptures numerous times. There's a lot of references to it. And so there's really no dispute of that. Uh, but it just may be some other little things about it that, you know, whether here or there or whatever. But uh, at least from the perspective that, that I see, there will be a temple some way, somehow, and it, it's kind of like Noah and the flood. So, Noah starts building his boat out in the desert, right? And he's telling him, God says he's going to flood the earth. Well, it had never even rained yet. So the people are all, you know, they're crazy, you know. And, and they're just scoffing and laughing and carrying on. But he knows what God has told him. And so he just goes on building the boat. Takes him a hundred years plus or minus a little bit, to build the boat. That's a long time. And so, they don't believe a word that he has said. Well, the proof of it was, what was the proof of it? When those raindrops started falling, and he was in the boat, the door was shut, and they couldn't get in. So, that's kind of like what some of these things are. God's telling us the facts. He's not telling us the timing. And so, you either believe him or you don't believe him, and you get ready or you don't get ready. And so, the proof of it, the real proof of it, is when it happens. 
But if you wait for that, you're going to be too late. So it's a matter of faith and believing God at his word and then acting upon it like Noah did. And he saved his family. And so that's the essence of the whole thing is we have to be ready before it happens because when it, he, he's probably not going to say, now he did tell Noah, he's, he told Noah, he said in seven days it's, the rain's coming. He did tell him ahead of time. Now, he's probably not going to tell us seven days before the rapture, okay, in seven days you're going. He's probably not telling us that. But, there are enough signs that we can see are already happening that, you know, it's not raining, but but there's dark clouds everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And they're getting darker every single day. Amen. And so the signs are there if we will look and if we will heed and pay attention. And so uh, that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to share with you today. And it's you know, just my perspective and commentary, you know, just some of the things Terry said. He's going to share next week. He'll have the lesson next week, and he'll, he'll give me some more fire.